These audio adventures are supported by writers, narrators, and listeners like you. Without your help, these stories can't be produced. If these stories feed your imagination, please consider helping me, Joshua David Ling, feed my family by visiting joshuadavidling.com support and becoming a monthly contributor. Or you can tip me on Cash App, dollar sign Joshua David Ling. If you'd like to have your audiobook or audio play featured here on Audio Adventures, get in contact with me at joshuadavidling.com. Today's episode is sponsored by the following. Hello, I'm Sarah Levesque, Editor-in-Chief of Logo Sophia Magazine. I would like to invite you to explore our Pilgrim's Journal of Life, Love, and Literature, both in visual format and in podcast format. Our goal is to help bridge the gaps between different Christian denominations and traditions. Please visit our website at logosophiamag.com to read or listen to stories, articles, poetry, and more, all for free. We look forward to journeying with you. For unique individuals with unique abilities, a weather controller, an illusionist, a knight, and a power copier unite to protect the Jewel of the South, Atlanta, Georgia. This is Guardians of Atlanta. 1. Slight of Hand The last time we left Cirrus Jones, she was given a proposition over the phone. That strange Mr. H had a mission for Psy, a mission that required a local spy. And so she went to a traveling carnival, Uncle Andy's by name it was known. It stopped in Alpharetta every year, but since Cirrus was little, it had grown. She followed her instructions to a T. Yes, she knew exactly where she was supposed to be. The magic tent with Bobby Carter. The crowds were crowding, getting hotter and hotter. The whiz kid, the great one, these were his names. He seemed addicted to large crowds, fortune, and fame. And with his entire act, Cirrus was impressed, from his magic tricks to his purple pinstriped vest. This is just a sleight of hand, no abracadabra pow or shazam. Let me get your attention over here. One, two, three, now you may cheer. The crowd's energy had reached a fever pitch. Cirrus was blown away by his fancy tricks. This charismatic creature was some enigma, but Cirrus couldn't shake that lingering stigma. She was here to find out his alleged ties to Philip Keller and his strange machines that fly. But that didn't stop her applause, oh no, and soon enough, it was the end of his show. He puffed with pride and took a bow, and just like that he bid them chow. He slipped out back as music played, and Cirrus gave chase as thoughts on her mind weighed. Could this be it? Her answer finally? Who helped kill Connor and wreck her family? There was one way to find out. Follow that mage. Then maybe in her life Cirrus could turn a page. This is just a sleight of hand. No abracadabra pow or shazam. Let me get your attention over here. One, two, three, now you may cheer. Two, the man behind the magic. After the tantalizing magic show, Cirrus followed Bobby through the crowds. He went around a corner and when Cirrus came around, he looked puffed up strong and proud. He said, what a show, wasn't it, ma'am? I'm a master of my art. Yes, you are, Bobby Carter. I don't even know where to start. Stop by not following me anymore. My show is over. Take a hike. Stop being a bore. Who's that man behind the magic? What is his game? Is it fun, or is he up to something much more grave? What's your connection to Stone Mountain? Oh, that chunk of rock? I got no connection there or here. The road is my home, and I am done with talk. Wait! I'm sorry, but all questions must be submitted in writing. However, the president of this carnival will not be fighting. Go talk to James Rigger. He'll tell you the information you need. Now go. Shoot. Cyrus walked off, more suspicious of Bobby than ever before. Who's that man behind the magic? What is his game? Is it fun? Or is he up to something much more grave? 3. Uncle Andy's Amazing Carnival This poem 
is from the perspective of Uncle Andy, a.k.a. James Rigger. What a pretty girl, what a pretty girl. Strutting right up to my trailer, please. What a pretty girl, what a pretty girl. Strutting right up in them cut-off jeans. She's the kind that up in start wars. She's the kind that men would die for. I guess that I should open my door, cause she's the kind that men would die for. Hello, my dear, I said to her meekly. What brings you to my humble abode? I come to talk, she said sweetly, about Stone Mountain down the road. It's been shut down for several months, an entire historical landmark. I was told by sources to ask Uncle Andy, please tell me where I should start. What a pretty girl, what a pretty girl, moving those lips with candy sheen. What a pretty girl, what a pretty girl. Up close, she's prettier than you've ever seen. She's the kind that up in start wars. She's the kind that men would die for. She makes other girls look like a bore, cause she's the kind that men would die for. Uncle Andy's how I'm currently known. I began slowly to start. The previous owner passed away, and girl, did it break my heart. So I haven't been in charge too long, but a connection? I have some doubts. If anyone around here would know anything, Madam Jemima would know all about. That pretty little girl nodded and went on her way, and I couldn't wait to see her again. 4. The Lights of Madam Jemima Cirrus left Uncle Andy's trailer. Not much said and not much gained. But one lead led her to Madame Jemima. She determined this talk would not be in vain. She had her suspicions about Uncle Andy. But none of them could be proved. The purple tent was just up yonder, and Cirrus's will would not be moved. The lights of Madame Jemima glittered inside of her purple tent. But Cirrus was not a quitter. No, she was persistent. Once inside, Cirrus coughed. The smell of incense was strong but soft. The rest you'd think would be cliché, a wise old woman worn by decay. But no, instead, a young black woman sat there by her table humming. Welcome, she said with a hushed tone. Welcome to Cirrus, the human cyclone. The lights of Madame Jemima glittered inside of her purple tent. But Cirrus was not a quitter, no. She was persistent. How did you know your name? I've done this for years. By now it's a game. You come seeking refuge for one that was lost. You want information, but at what cost? Cirrus, this carnival, it's on edge. It's all but ready to fall. No one can be trusted. No, not one. But soon you must make a call. The mysterious or the suspicious. One you've met and one you've missed. In a circus act, you must hit your cues. Now go, I have paying customers. Shoo! The lights of Madame Jemima glittered inside of her purple tent. But Cirrus was not a quitter, no. She was persistent. Cirrus began to protest, but then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw a shadowy figure atop one of the tents. 5. Purple Shadows Shadows flow in the darkness, creeping inside my head. Shadows, they all surround me, filling my heart with dread. Silence, it is oppressive. Noises, they shake my bones. Fear grips with awesome power, even a strong cyclone. A misty purple-black shadow beckoned Cirrus cold and slow. Come with me, said a voice she heard. Come with me and hear the word. The voice she caught was in her brain. It made Cirrus feel like she was insane, but refusing didn't even cross her mind when it came to prudence. She was now blind. She chased it to an old fun house and followed the shadow inside. Then she heard that voice again. Get ready for the ride of your life! 
before her eyes, she saw a scene just as if it were on a screen. James Rigger standing with a scythe, hacking and slashing with all his might. James Rigger's ire was at an all-time high, swinging his scythe right through the sky, tearing into circus performers, committing acts of unspeakable murder. But Cirrus snapped out of her vision, just in time, to see James grinning. He swung his scythe, but the shadow blocked. Then Cirrus blacked out from pure shock. Shadows flow in the darkness, creeping inside my head. Shadows, they all surround me, filling my heart with dread. Silence, it is oppressive. Noises, they shake my bones. Fear grips with awesome power, even a strong cyclone. Cirrus awoke in Jemima's tent. She sat up, her back creaked, her energy was spent. She rose and looked, but no one was around. She peeked outside that purple tent, and here is what she found. Bobby Carter standing guard, watching over the tent door. It was late at night. Hours had flown by, and man, oh man, was she ever sore. She walked outside. He greeted her there. Good to see you unharmed. What in the world happened to me? Nothing. No reason for alarm. Bobby began to walk away, but Cirrus grabbed his sleeve and made him stay. Was what I saw last night real? How would I know? Your thoughts aren't something I can feel. You know more than you're letting on. I'm just a magician. There's no way you're wrong. Stop with the act and listen to me. Open your eyes and maybe then you'll see. This carnival has more going on than you know. You're in danger, Cirrus. This isn't a show. You just need to learn to take your cues. That's it! Time's up, Bobby! It's time for you to choose! Are you going to tell me what's up or not? Just take your cues and you won't get lost. You're making me frustrated. Yes, I know. Just be patient. Wait your turn, and then you'll be in the show. Bobby Carter walked away, making Cirrus more frustrated than ever. 7. Slow down and think. Following the argument with Cirrus Jones, Bobby Carter met with Jemima alone. The two found a place in the nearby woods where they could talk privately and be understood. She's working very hard to find out what's going on here and what this is all about. She works hard, but she doesn't ask the right things. Eventually, she'd wear out from all the carnival brings. Good thing we're here, then, to show her the way. I'm concerned about her being in the fray. What if she didn't have the power of storms? She does, Bobby. Ever since the day she was born. Whatever. As long as she takes her cues and doesn't blink, she'll be fine. Now let's just slow down and think. Sometimes things aren't clear. Sometimes things are clouded by fear. Just slow down and think it through. Take your cues and change your view. Cirrus walked around the carnival and thought. Was she at the end of her rope? She stopped and prayed and asked God for help. He would not let her lose hope. But then, from the center of the carnival, she heard the sound of James Rigger's voice and the crowd being stirred. She ran to the site to see what was going on, but it was hard to get through the gathering throng. Sometimes things aren't clear. Sometimes things are clouded by fear. Just slow down and think it through. Take your cues and change your view. 8. My Power, My Carnival Uncle Andy was on the stage that was set. The crowd seemed immune to the lingering threat. The air was thick with the power of fright as James Rigger, Uncle Andy, pulled out his scythe. No need for alarm, he announced calmly. I'm simply taking out the trash. I'm weary of cloak and dagger tactics. It's time for a little slash and dash. My power, my carnival, this isn't a joke. I'll destroy what I want with one fell stroke. My power, my carnival, why can't you see? I have the power. It's all inside of me. Cirrus tried to use her power, raised her hands up high, but the rain would just not come. Then someone jumped on stage and his voice was picked up by the nearby microphone. James, stop this now. This wasn't part of the plan. 
Oh, and the gas leak at Stone Mountain was? I told you, there was no gas leak. The early carnival was a distraction because... Look, I don't have time for this. It's time for Slash and Dash, just like the old Andy went. I'll slay the KKK, I'll purge the plague. And all of my stale acts, your time is spent. Just then, James reached down and grabbed Jemima, who was standing in front with the score. Cirrus wanted to run up and fight Uncle Andy, but getting through the crowd was more than a chore. The man that jumped on stage, Andy took him down. Then the crowd was subdued by gun-carrying clowns. But then there came a sound which no one expected, and once again the air itself was affected. 9. Introducing the Great Phantasma just as James was giving his speech, the speakers fed back with a terrible screech. Following that came an announcer's cry. The sideshow collar type puffed up and spry. Come one, come all, said the voice in a blast. The great phantasma has arrived at last. But please, hold your applause till the performance has ended. I do believe you'll find it perfectly splendid. Who are you? Where are you? James Rigger barked. I'm here and there and everywhere to start. Then the shadow Cirrus saw before appeared. The crowd was confused, but some of them cheered. The shadow materialized and changed its shape to a man who was wearing a dapper suit and a cape. His top hat was purple and his wand was swift, and as he swung it around, Uncle Andy had a fit. This is my power! Your carnival, yes I know, but I think that you'll find that I've hijacked this show. Just then, Uncle Andy dropped Jemima and swung right at the shadow figure. Cyrus thought he was done. But right as James did, the figure disappeared. Then Jemima kicked James low and James's anger seared. The figure reappeared, but this time there was more. Multiple versions of the figure surrounded James in scores. Twenty or more figures laughed gleefully at him. That's it! James cried. I'll cut you limb from limb! James began swinging with terrible force, but the figures began to disappear. Cirrus tried to keep the crowd calm, but they were all completely gripped by fear. Then suddenly the shadow winked his eye in Cirrus's general direction. Then Cirrus saw her angel, Ezekiel, in that eye's reflection. Ezekiel's appearance meant only one thing as her powers began to tug. The sky opened wide and rain poured down, and soon it became a flash flood. Hail rained down on James Rigger as Cirrus squeezed the ice from the clouds. The lightnings raged, the thunder roared, and screaming echoed from the crowd. The clown guard seemed to be terrified by the weather, but more than the rainfall. The light shined right through the streams of water, creating illusions great and small. The shadow seemed to bend the light from every angle known, and for a couple of minutes everyone felt like they were in the Twilight Zone. 10. And the show goes on. A little while later, the police arrived and took Uncle Andy to jail. The clowns were rounded up, everyone was questioned, and justice did not fail. Cirrus stuck around to see the rest of the carnival meet. Fans and carny folk stayed near the stage to watch Madame Jemima speak. She stood on the podium, proud and strong, if a little worse for wear. She then spoke up in a strong voice. Let's bow our head and say a prayer. Thank you, God, for saving us all. Your marvelous name we praise. Help us to decide who should now run this show in James's place. It might have been rude, but a few shouted out the obvious answer then. Jemima! came a voice. Jemima! echoed another, and Jemima said, Amen. The gathering voted quickly that Jemima would run the show. Cyrus smiled and began to leave, but the shadow wouldn't let her go. He materialized in front of her and revealed himself as Bobby. Did I hit my cues? You know, you didn't have to be snobby. Bobby smiled and said to her, There's more that you need to know. James Rigger and those men are planning something to upset the status quo. I'll listen on one condition, Bobby. You give up this stage. Come with me. You're a person to meet. His name is Mr. H. 
11. Interlude. A Circus Girl. Once there was a little girl born into a carnival. She never knew who her parents were. She was raised by them all. This was the tradition amongst the band of misfits with life on the road. All children at Uncle Andy's would help to share the load. And the load of their being would be shared by all the members within that tribe. Many generations had done this before, and it made them full of pride. But back to our girl. She was raised like many children before, and she grew up into an act of her own and learned many tricks and stored all of them within her heart and mind in a manner quite bohemian. She became a fortune teller, a tricky, psychic medium. Her success gained her much acclaim, and after a hard day's work, she'd raise a glass or two or eight and dance for joy and sport. Yet all this partying glee gave way to the thing that she feared the most, to continue the cycle of child neglect, and she had become a host. A host to a little baby boy in her womb, who she would be told to let go, and be a part of the carnival's working troop. She would not let this be so. She vowed within herself to tell him, when he became old enough, that she was his mother. She didn't care. What could they do? What? She would love her child as her own and keep it a secret between them two. Jemima gave birth and named the child Bobby, and they stuck together like glue. 12. Interlude. The Great Phantasma's Wand. Carnival life can be very hard on anyone, great or small, but for Bobby Carter the hardest things were what he loved most of all. The summer he turned ten he began to do more chores pounding tent stakes, hauling loads, and selling tickets and scores. Then one day his birthday came and he received a gift that Madame Jemima had made with her hands for all that he did lift. You've become strong, she said to him as she unwrapped his reward. I'm very proud of what you've done. Did you buy me a sword? Jemima laughed and shook her head as he pulled out a wand. He gave her a somewhat quizzical look. Sorry, that guess was wrong, but this wand will give you an act that no one will forget. It creates illusions in thin air, but you need to practice with it. I used a special light and stone that were given to me years ago, and it's not too dissimilar from old toys like a kaleidoscope. This is cool and all, Bobby said with a frown, but I really wanted a sword. Somehow I think. You will find this wand won't make you bored. 13. Interlude. Dream Girl. During Bobby Carter's 21st summer, in the middle of the season's tour, Bobby Carter got a whole lot more than he ever bargained for. True, the ride was smooth as ever across the tracks and towns, but this summer something happened that would forever make him smile and frown. The show was in Champaign, Illinois. The crowd was the usual size. Nothing tipped Bobby off about his lingering surprise. He expertly removed six stuffed rabbits from his hat, increasing in ridiculous style, finishing with a rabbit hopping on stage, but this time it went a little wild. Instead of hopping straight to Bobby, it hopped into the crowd. A young woman caught it with a leap in the air and she received applause, strong and loud. Give it up for the lovely lady, Bobby bellowed to his fans. Then the woman caught his eye with unspoken demands. The smirk across her mocha face suggested a mischief thinly veiled, as she petted the rabbit slowly and sweetly, and with her eyes told a tale. Bobby nearly tripped from watching the meaning in her eyes, the sweet and subtle motions she had had him all mystified. I'll come for the rabbit after the show, he said, then continued on, and after the show was over, she waited with a smile on. After the tent had completely cleared except for the rabbit and girl, Bobby Carter took a deep breath and stepped through the curtain into another world. Thanks for catching Felix. He's been known to be a bit wild. He must have sensed a kindred spirit, 
she said in a voice that was mild. Bobby Carter, he held his hand out. But you knew that already. Who might you be, ma'am? I am a woman enraptured by you, and the presence that you have on that stage. I am in search of another life, and just haven't found my place. But what you have, it works for me. I think I'll try it out. Oh, and my name's Tamara. Sorry I left that out. The two shared an awkward laugh, then looked one another in the eye. Bobby had seen many girls like this, and many of them were sly. He'd occasionally indulge himself as a favor to the fans, but this girl took his breath away. He warned himself to be careful, but he couldn't be careful that day. They stayed up till all hours of the night just talking and carrying on, dancing in the light of the moon, until the train left at dawn. But Bobby Carter slept way past that and awoke with a start, concerned that Tamara had stayed aboard the train. He quickly began to turn. But beside him, as the train rumbled on, was a simple note and number. He held it close to his heart, smiled, and returned to slumber. But somewhere in between his dreams and his waking state, the old window in his cabin gave out and opened its gate. The note was torn from Bobby's hand and floated away in the breeze. Bobby tried to catch up with it, but it would not be with ease. For now, he'd have to settle on memories and the light of the time he spent with Tamara on that one dream night. 14. Interlude Try again, Uncle Andy. James Rigger sat in a cell, straitjacket holding his arms. He chuckled quietly to himself. He didn't want to raise the alarm. His door then opened slowly, and he expected to see that annoying psych person again. They just wouldn't let him be. Instead, he saw a woman in red, followed by a woman in white. They were both identical twins, with raven black hair and slight. Two pretty girls, two pretty girls, strutting right up to my person? Please, you've been a naughty boy, Uncle Andy. You've deviated from the plan. But thankfully, Red Death said, to give you a second chance. The two girls parted, and into the room, a man in a wheelchair rolled in. Uncle Andy chuckled louder, and the wheelchaired man grinned. And he wouldn't have it if I hadn't stood up for you. You better not let me down. Didn't know you knew, Red Philip. Shut up, you little clown. It's time you start taking orders, and you'll be taking them from me. James then launched into a cackle filled with malicious glee. Thanks for listening to this episode of Audio Adventures. If your imagination was fed by this story, I pray that you'll consider supporting these stories at joshuadavidling.com slash support or on Cash App, dollar sign Joshua David Ling. Until next time, keep adventuring.